Well, thank you all so much for coming to Oxtails and Cocktails. My name is Sierra McKissick and I'm the Communications Associate and Programmer for Oxbo. We're really excited to launch some of our new virtual online programming. We're really trying to engage with our community as we continue to limit our in-person activities. Through our new programs, we hope to better connect with our alumni, our faculty and friends like you who live in practice across the globe. Today, we're excited to launch our new virtual talk series, Oxtails and Cocktails, a monthly conversation held on Zoom between our executive director, Shannon Stratton, and artists and makers and thinkers from our Oxbow community. And you can join us every third Wednesday of the month from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time for conversations about Oxbow, art, and more. And tonight, we're really excited to talk to Matt Morris, who designed and curated and concocted our Mary Kay scent really, really excited to be here in conversation with him and Shannon tonight. I definitely want to tell you all about Matt. So Matt Morris is an artist, a writer, an educator, and curator based in Chicago. He has presented artwork nationally and internationally. He is a contributor to artforum.com, Flash Art, Fragrantia, Fragrantica, The Scene, Extra Contemporary Art Quarterly, and other publications. And in his writing appears in numerous exhibition catalogs and artist monographs. He is a transplant from Southern Louisiana and holds a BFA from the Art Academy of Cincinnati and earned an MFA in art theory and practice from Northwestern University, as well as a certificate in gender and sexuality studies. In 2017, he earned a certification in fairyology from Doreen Virtue, PhD. In 2020, Morris received the prestigious Black Pudding Award from the annual Raymond Hood Mill Millinery Awards. Morris is an adjunct assistant professor at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. Morris co-taught a series of workshops on perfumery and painting with Katie Kerbach at, I'm gonna hope I don't butcher this name, Kuntho Kunshu Mainz, <laughs> Mainz, Germany. Morris is currently an assistant adjunct professor in painting and drawing at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago and is a very near and dear friend to us here at Oxbow. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Shannon and Matt so they can be in conversation tonight about his practice, how he came to make the Oxbow Mary Kay scent and more tales as well. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Thanks, Sierra. Thank you, Sierra, that was beautiful. Um, I'm just gonna, oh, there we go. Hey, Matt. Hey, Shannon. How are you? I'm feeling pretty good. Good. You're looking really great. Am I? Fabulous, actually. Really good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was so excited to have a reason to dress up tonight for the first time in, I don't know, months. So mm -hmm. um, I put on lipstick for the first time in a year. So hey. thank you for giving me the occasion to freshen up a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and freshen up oh, with yeah. aviation. So um, cheers for everyone who's joining us for our first oxtail and cocktail. Um, I didn't do so well with making my aviation very purple, but it is super tasty. Um, I asked Matt to choose our cocktail for tonight um, and she chose the aviation. Do you want to tell us why? Um, yeah, I mean, I have this like sort of panoply of thoughts that um, my, I immediately thought of it as just a very perfumey kind of cocktail that because of the creme de violette and, and using a really floral forward gin, you just get this really like kind of heady experience with the cocktail that is probably closer for me to experiencing like perfume itself. Um, but then uh, as it's inauguration day, uh, Kamala Harris comes out to be inaugurated wearing a, a resplendent purple outfit um, oh. by uh, who, Christopher John Rogers, is that his name? designer and it immediately made me think about our aviation cocktails and alice walker's beautiful sentence womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender um and uh i can't i can't credit that as magic we uh foretold but um it seems auspicious for our little purple cocktails today it is an auspicious state as i pointed out in our little pre-meet too it is one two zero two zero two one. So hopefully anything that's auspicious today is positive. Um, that's my hope for all of us. 
Um, one other thing, we got a bit of a soundtrack in the back, which was an, an accidental thing that happened when I was prepping for today and reading some of your own words. Um, and I was super excited that you have spent most of quarantine listening to one of my favorites, the Cocktail Twins. Mm -hmm. So um, now you've inspired me to get a playlist every time I, we have oxtails and cocktails. I think you should. <laughs> um, why have you been listening to the Cocktail Twins so much this year? Well, um, the main thing I've been listening to for uh, several years now is Hildegard von Bingen, the oh my God. Um, mystic, feminist, feminine and mystic um, choral writer. And so my, my very rare excursions away from Hildegard um, have definitely sort of carried some of that dreamy, visionary sort of uh, tonalities. So Cocteau Twins, Celine Dion, I think that's pretty much it though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did, uh, did the, the Cocteau Twins get you through 2020 in, a, um, in an uplifting way? I think so. It, I mean, I think that they, what, they always kind of have that powdery uh, fairy dust sort of, um, everything is sort of sitting in the field of the sound. Um, and when I look back over the things I've been making over the past year, I can really see corollaries there for sure. Um, and I'm a twin, so <laughs> I'm predisposed. Right. Um, and my twin is here. I noticed that actually. Um, I uh, saw him there in the um, in the guests. So, m hello, Michael's twin or M Matt's twin, Michael, right? Yep, their name yeah. is Michael J. Morse. Yes, nice to see you, Michael. So, as everybody heard in the introduction, um, Matt made for Oxbow designed our very first scent, um, which we're really excited to uh, release just this past fall, called the Mary Kay. At the end of our talk, we'll hear a little bit more about how one blends a scent. Um, but I guess really I'm, I'm going to focus on asking you, um, probably talking to you a little bit more about what it means to have a perfume practice. Um, but first, um, I know you're going to kick us off with um, And you're a milliner now. So um, I think there's a lot of things that you have to share with us. And I'm sorry that we don't have like two hours to find out all about kind of everything. And um, so we'll give people um, an um, appetizer uh, tonight and hopefully they'll spend some more time um, with your work um, through the interwebs or getting in touch in other ways. So I'll let you take over a little bit here um, with a screen share. Yeah, this will be a little amuse bouche. Um, we've gotten to this point now where there inevitably, invariably there's this moment where someone um, becomes self-conscious as they say, it seems you wear many hats. And of course they do wear many hats. <laughs> um, but uh, it's become more literalized. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try Shannon to run through these. Um, and uh, are y'all seeing what I, are y'all seeing like a slide? Um, a beautiful woman in a beautiful hat. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, well then we're gonna sort of run in. Uh, you know, for such a short introduction, the starting point is a little arbitrary. Um, and so I was thinking about these years directly following my time at Northwestern um, and this body of paintings that I called monochromes, although I, I think we could really argue or, or sort of debate that as a terminology because I think what was happening in this body of work was that I was starting to shift in my thinking away from that sort of stripped down quasi minimalism that had been popularized under that sort of heading of queer formalism. Um, and instead I was becoming more sensitive to the ways queer subjectivity and, and maybe even more so femininity have been pressured into a kind of restrained comportment. Um, like, for examples, um, I think a lot about the difference between the kind of controlled, um, coy, uh, visual languages of the more popular works that people associate with Felix Gonzalez Torres, and then documentation of his home life that where vintage toys and action figures and kitty cats seem to pile up in a much more expressive um, manner. And we might also think of like, I don't know, um, 
like Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro, who eventually come into working in really ornamental, excessive ways, but initially both described feeling a lot of pressure to, um, to conform to a type of austerity uh, in order to even have a presence in the art world. And so in these, in these little paintings, um, I, I started like seeing if I could take something as distilled as the monochrome and start charging it with, a, with formal material and associative material, uh, associations into the paintings um, and see if I could kind of uh, get them to uh, layer and blush and blossom with little characterizations. And so um, along with looking at the surfaces, we might sort of, I might call attention that the language around them, they, they, they take on these sort of uh, gay subcultural lingos in the titles. So this one is Fagnus Martin and Fay, which can mean fairy, but it can also mean full of dread. Um, and uh, I, um, I started wanting to try to delve deeper into what I, I generally think of in my own studio as the excesses. Um, the, the French feminist philosophers who inform a lot of my work would call it jouissance. Um, and, um, but it's also for me, marginalia, uh, what goes out of bounds and the codes by which obscenity um, disguises itself and communicates internally in sort of plain sight of hegemonic power. Um, and so this really sort of uh, carried me into a, a really different period of painting more recently. Um, and I've come to think of, uh, of this work as very deliberately reactionary. The way I see when I look back at what's called the pattern and decoration movement in especially painting and installation as reactionary as well. Um, so these paintings are called Predators. Um, and I, I think one of the things that they signal is a deep preoccupation with history um, and an analysis of how history is constructed and by whom. Um, and, and really also trying to underscore my position within that uh, research as a kind of a fet melancholic um, that's looking and examining the past in a way that runs parallel to, but also is very deliberately pitted against the sort of MAGA sentiments that we encounter in the United States now. Um, long before Hillary Clinton's 2017 book, psychoanalysts and Proustian queers have been asking what happened. The set of paintings is based on a, a label for soap from around the late 20s, or early 1930s. And that time period sort of uh, bookends this range of uh, periods that I'm looking to um, that have um, been marked by historical shifts in power. So this could go back as far as um, 17th century European court life um, up to uh, the industrial revolution hitting its stride um, and the implications of those power moves. Um, my, my vantage, my point of access to these sort of deeper structural questions about civilization um, is always uh, a performance of the frivolous. Um, frippery is a word that uh, gets bandied about between me and my psychoanalyst a lot. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in the way that seeming frivolity uh, always carries with it a clear politics, um, not only of the profitability, but also the long-term um, exertion of power and authority around regulating things like gender and fashion. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly describe what, what we're looking at here. This is an installation of works that I just, I call batons. Um, and after Trump was elected, I started taking my slide lectures from my classrooms at SAC and printing them on satin and then gathering them into these ruched uh, columnar works. Um, and oftentimes when they are presented in exhibition space, they have these sort of footnotes that get arranged nearby. Um, in this case, there are some glass containers with uh, potpourri that I've made in my studio. And there's also a CB2 glass decanter filled, by, filled with the perfume taboo 
Idena, um, which was designed by Jean Carl in 1932. Um, and I think, you know, this space beyond just the paintings, when I look back over the last 10 years of my work, I, I, I think I see that I've been setting a scene that I wasn't totally aware of with each move um, that uh, is refining um, and sort of creating a line in the sand about who's willing to be in the space. Um, what that space is, I maybe for the moment, I'll just say, I think it's like a boudoir. Um, it's sort of burlesque um, flavored. And uh, the, what interests me about it is that it seems that with these additional forms, these additional mediums um, that are gathering around painting, um, the space that's conjured seems to expel uh, sort of strident forms of heterosexism and masculinity. It's not a space for those kinds of energies. <laughs> As you brought up, uh, this year has also um, created a turn in my work to um, bring in millinery. And I do think of it as very related to the perfume work um, and also very related to the baton works that are made alongside of them. Um, you know, Elaine Stritch famously says in Company, does anyone still wear a hat? And I was thinking about uh, this exhibition of Ulrika Muller's um, that was titled The Old Expressions Are With Us Always and There Are Always Others. Um, and I think those sentiments may be side by side, the provocation embedded in them about time and era um, and value systems um, is wrapped around what I'm interested in by making art objects that are hats. Um, I'm, I'm curious and fascinated by what happens when I take information um, that is similar to what might appear in the paintings and I put it in the hat and there's a very different level of comfort or initiation or a willingness to dismiss it um, as maybe fashion or as uh, too feminine or as too eccentric. Um, and I'm thinking a lot about like, uh, we've been watching a lot of film, a lot of TV this year and actually hats are all over even contemporary movies um, and all fashion editorials. And yet they're very, very rare on the street. Um, and this is a fairly, well, I should say briefly what these two hats are um, on these very bad girls behind the gymnasium who are smoking cigarettes <laughs> are, um, are a series of exhibition hats that are called Fresh Widow, um, where uh, sort of just as we were going into COVID, um, I was finding that I was having ideas for more exhibitions to curate than I had spaces um, accessible to me to stage those exhibitions. And so I started making little exhibitions on these hats that then could be worn on your head. Um, and then this is a very recent hat um, that came about around the same time as the one that I'm wearing during our conversation uh, that are inspired by powder puffs um, and, uh, and a kind of showgirl um, ethos. They're very delicate. And I think what, what sort of brought me to this level of that vocabulary is that um, Again, in the months just before we went into lockdown last year, I was amused and really um, sort of uh, rap, uh, had a kind of rapt attention about the ways, how do I want to word this? There was an ele elevated level of um, disgust and raw hostility directed toward me from men who, I was going to say men who take them who I might presume would to be heterosexual, but maybe they might presume that they are heterosexual. And, um, and the hat sort of signaled something that uh, seemed to be escalated from the maybe more general um, homophobia and misogyny that I've observed through my life. Um, and, and there's a part of me that's sort of tickled by that, if I'm honest. Okay, I'm gonna briefly go back to the very beginning of the perfume and then try to give like a few stops on the way to where we are now. Um, just as I was finishing undergrad, um, the first exhibitions I had, I would select a bottle of perfume that would be kind of the emblematic scent of that show. Um, and then I would, before the exhibition opened, kind of like crash, um, what do people do uh, where they beat, they don't beat, like a champagne bottle where they like, 
smash it against the boat. Um, it was sort of like that. I would do it in private. I would like kind of well up all of my feelings and then I would hurl the perfume bottle and glass would shatter and an oily puddle would appear on the floor. Um, and so this was the first time that happened. And you can see that this is like, you know, a child using a very early digital camera. Um, that uh, the perfume itself was actually a Sephora perfume. And I thought the bottle wasn't classy enough. So I like found an antique bottle and put, decanted it in that before I hurled it. And then around the same time was this one called Replies. And just in the span of a year, um, I can look back now and see that like my scent literacy uh, was growing exponentially. That like the second scent that I selected was a Comme des Garçons perfume by, that was designed by Bertrand Dochefort. Um, I think maybe the thing I'll say here is that, um, you know, a lot of artists talk, a lot of artists who work with scent talk about olfactory art. And, um, and I am interested in that. I write about olfactory art. I, I think it might be worth sort of isolating that um, I work in the, as, as I think you said, Shannon, like I work in the mode of perfume. Um, I'm interested in perfumes associations to um, so-called femininity and uh, dandyism um, and sort of a foppish relationship to fashion. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the form um, and its historical referentiality. Um, and this often informs how I, uh, how I select what materials go into them. Um, but of course, I think it's worth acknowledging too that memory plays a big part. Um, in some ways, smell, we might not always think about this, this way, but smell is almost synonymous with memory. Um, our, we absorb um, scent molecules into the tissues lining our noses faster than our brains can operate. And so our body is already recognizing these histories before we can even put words to it. Um, so this was a project in 2017 of mine called Copycat Killer. I'm just, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna read what I wrote here. Four hand blended, hand -blended eau de parfum based on fragrances worn by me, uh, my twin, um, and our mother and father. Uh, these perfumes were worn during gallery hours by the four directors of the wonderful gallery in Chicago, Julius Caesar, or substitutes that they may have selected when they were unable to be at the gallery that day. Um, so in this case, I was sort of, I was thinking about like the very long history of people making knockoff perfumes. And I was trying to blend perfumes that smelled like the things the four of us in my family wear. And I was also trying to add musks and synthetic animalic notes in very low quantities that would also give the impression of our bodies wearing the scent. So what the four uh, directors at Caesar were wearing were these references to the perfumes being worn on the Morris's bodies. Uh, this is a candle that came out in 2019 um, through Field and Florist. It was um, that I worked on the perfume for. We can talk about it a bit more uh, later if people have questions about it. Uh, they recently made a second edition of it. Um, and I think there's still a few there. Um, and so this was working with very close friends of mine um, to make a signature candle for them. Um, and uh, so again, I'll just read the notes. One of the things Heidi and Molly who run Field and Florist said at the front end was that they really didn't want the candle to smell like flowers. Um, and, uh, and so I was looking at their business model of, um, of growing the crops of flowers that they sell out on um, land in Michigan and decided to sort of create a narrative in the candle. And so uh, the first sort of notes that, you rec that one recognizes is sun warmed farm soil uh, these really snappy green notes um, of stems and um, galbanum is really one of the main notes in it. Geosmin is an, a synthetic aroma chemical that smells a lot like wet earth. And there's lavender, beeswax, um, Sri Lankan nutmeg, peppercorn, coriander seed, driving across the states, like trying to create a passage of time in the smell, cedarwood, patchouli, vetiver, mossy notes, castorium, traces of magnolia blossom, and then ultimately city vapors. Like we were, we were seeking like a little bit of like car exhaust and a little bit of like spray paint fumes um, to be some of the lingering effects of this scent. And so then this is my last slide for the moment. Um, 
Advanced Potions is a piece from 2019. Um, and it, it's sort of adjacent to my perfume practice. It's sort of, um, it fits into a kind of lineage of conceptual art um, where this is a, a display, like a, a display of bottles. Um, I didn't make anything that, uh, that appears in these various niches. Um, and in fact, most of them are gathered from friends and family members and collaborators and a few people that I'm big fans of. Um, and, uh, and in this sort of tradition, nothing here could be smelled. Um, this, was a, this was a sort of sealed object in a way where these bottles were seen but not open. Um, and as I, there's a long history of uh, Duchamp and Kiki Smith and Nayland, Nayland Blake and lots of artists who invoke the sign of the perfume bottle without necessarily giving you access. Um, and so this was advanced potions. There's a lot to say about it. I'll try to keep it fairly brief. Um, each, each bottle came from other people um, that I, I was asking, as I say, friends, family, loved ones, people in my professional network to contribute these little vials of various things to. Um, there's this sort of reflexive moment here that I really love that in Copycat Killer, the piece I was describing about my family, um, I had made a perfume based on this love spell that my sibling wears. Um, and then it seemed very, um, I don't know, it, it felt very appropriate to actually bring the original material that I was referencing into this work. One thing I can say in passing about advanced potions is that I was looking, I was in search of an ethics for appropriation, um, I, that appropriative gestures um, the sort of stripping away of um, singularity around authorship um, and maybe a kind of um, tender contemplation about interdependency was sort of stoking my desire to find other gestures that could sit alongside just wholesale copying without permission and stealing like theft that that is a part of a lot of things I do in my work. Okay, that was the I don't know how quick that was, but that was, that was, um, that's my overview. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. No, I mean, that was wonderful. I think that gives uh, a pretty good sense of, I mean, yeah, it's an amuse-bouche and gets people, um, I think, you know, more familiar with your work if they're not already familiar with it. I know some of the folks here tonight probably are, but some of the folks who see the recorded version might not be. Um, so I'm glad that's kind of where you, and there's a, cat near me um, and it, um, because I think I will admit that the first time I, I recognized that you were working with perfume was when I came to your show at Tiger Strikes Asteroid in Brooklyn, um, the uh, Splitsville Smells Like Irises exhibition. And um, so that was the first time I realized you'd been working with scent for a while. And I remember we had a, a really like, lovely conversation that evening about um, the way you were working with scent and um, how important perfume was to your research and the work you were doing. And I think um, tonight when I was getting ready, I was thinking about this piece, Advanced Potions, but then a lot of um, things, I guess, in your practice, even the way you treat your website, but shows like, um, shows like the one at Tiger Strikes Asteroid, um, projects like posters where you're painting paintings of Florence Detheimer's, um, it, it seems like there's a, a significant part of your practice is about, um, I, I guess, honoring and responding to other artists. And there's a, a lot of blending that goes on, like in a show, that, like the show at Tiger Strikes Asteroid or like Advanced Potions, where you're bringing kind of all of these parts together to make a kind of experience um, for an audience member and a viewer to the work. And I guess I started thinking about that as blending and that, that um, I wondered if, if you might be able to speak to the concept of blending um, or you know, creating things from um, uh, predetermined objects, like a scent is already a thing. And when we talked a little bit about making um, a scent earlier, you were pointing out that it's, they're like standalone things that layer on top of each other. You can't, it's not just like, it's not like mixing paint. So is there a relationship at all there for you, like conceptually between the way you work that way with objects and people and ideas and the thing that's happening in, in making a perfume? 
I think there definitely is. Um, the way, hmm. let's lay some ground. Um, I am highly suspicious of subjecthood as it's been philosophized over the last 200 years. Um, the individual, the I as discrete that has since its inception um, gotten picked up by what we might call neoliberalism um, where the individual is further alienated. and You and I are meant to be in competition with each other for the, the too small amount of the art world that can nourish us and so on. Um, I don't believe in that and I, and I act against it in sort of every level of, of the work I do whenever I can. Um, and, and I think, so over here is a sort of like political specter of um, resisting monolithic identity. And over here is, um, is maybe like personal history and psychology that like uh, my twin and I were conjoined when we were born. Um, and uh, something that I, I think about and also dream about is that um, the decision of where to cut us apart was an entirely culturally informed gesture, right? Like that this is the slice that will produce two whole people or something. Um, and there's kind of an open question of, um, of like how much of each of us was continuous with the other um, and maybe still is. And so I think I'm, I'm grappling with this, as I say, this sort of um, disturbing history um, that, that seems to reinforce white supremacy and seems to reinforce um, heterosexism by, by making a heroic eye um, that I'm always trying to destabilize in the work. Um, and then I'm reckoning with something like um, a type of uh, very tender trauma that um, is navigating what attachment looks like, what attachment looks like the next time I try to attach um, to someone or something. Um, as that relates to perfume, um, I think of this all the time because, uh, because what is that horrible perfume? Eric, what's that terrible perfume? <laughs> Is it Santal 33? Anyone chime in? So many awful perfumes. Where do we begin? <laughs> Let me check. Yeah, it is. It's Santal 33. So don't if if you're um if you're a fan of it, don't come for me. <laughs> but um, but it's an odious perfume made by Le Labo, and um and it's very popular. And there's this interesting thing about someone having a signature perfume that millions of other people also have as their signature perfume. Um, there's something sort of like squishy and intriguing about what we, what, what are the building blocks that we pick up to assign something to ourselves about what mm -hmm. we think we're self-determining about an identity when maybe perfume makes it so clear um, it's also like what I'm saying about perfume is true about language, just uh, at its most basic um, of being a, this sort of assemblage of used objects. But, um, but the way perfume gets circulated, the way it gets employed for toward the end of an identity um, construction uh, maybe makes it super plain and obvious that, that we are these sort of interdependent constructions. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it, I mean, it also, I mean, I, I think it, I, I just want to maybe add to that hearing your answer about maybe how something like a scent, um, whether it's a perfume or whether it's just a scent that's in the world is something that that trails behind us all the time or even introduces us. It's a kind of a cloud that um, uh, doesn't have any boundaries, right? So it, it can encompass other people without touch. It can trail behind us and be sort of a residue that we drag behind us. So it's it's maybe something that like navigates ideas about space between two people and it keeps people connected temporarily within a space. Um, at, like the time at a media. Media. <laughs> I think part of what you're saying is like, part of what you're alluding to is um, at a molecular level that like that, that, that stream of scent that the French call sillage, that trail <laughs> of the perfume, um, in some ways it's like running as a kind of connection into the tissue of our bodies. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's something where the perfume becomes a kind of liminal stuff that, uh, that blurs our edges, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it makes for an interesting sort of transition between two people, especially if two people have 
their sense sort of blending and mixing. There's a there's like an in between space between the two of them where they're connected. That's a third space. It's Gosh, I mean, actually, what you're bringing up is something that I've eventually considered a technical challenge to figure out in my practice. But Copycat Killer, one of the things I didn't quite anticipate was that it was such a small gallery that really people only smelled one thing. There were four distinct reenactments happening in scent, but there was a family smell yeah. <laughs> when you walked into the room. And it wasn't ambiguous. There were like two very clean, very uptight, very conservative smells. Mm -hmm. And then there were two kind of raunchy sweet smells. Mm -hmm. And um, and I it wasn't made like I didn't identify to anyone who was who, but you felt, you felt, I think, from what I heard from strangers and things, you felt the tension um, between those zones as they sort of all melded into a sort of single psychological atmosphere. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm going to jump all over, like I said, I said, I'd maybe stick to these five key questions, but I'm not going to, <laughs> because now I want to talk about that, which is, um, which is what it, exactly it is that scent creates, like that it creates this kind of psychological space that might have tension to it or might have, like that has affect of some kind or has some kind of, um, you know, mm, yeah, some affect or some sense of uh, some sort of electrical sort of sense to it that is a little bit, you know, um, indefinable, I think in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of mentally jumping ahead to thinking, and then I'm gonna back off from this for a moment before we get into how you make sense, but I'm thinking about how we talked about um, your development of the Mary Kay scent, and you were, you sent three different um, possibilities. And just for those who are listening, Mary Kay was um, a historic figure at Oxbow. She was our unofficial caretaker. Um, for several decades. Um, her and her partner, Jean Palmer, um, eventually bought one of the cabins on, on the property. Um, and uh, they also lived in Sagatuck, but they came, they also used the cabin in the summer. And uh, Mary Kay was sort of the unofficial caretaker. She'd keep an eye on the campus all the time in the winter. She had this big dog Rex that she would bring down. She had a fake sheriff's badge that she'd wear to tell run people off the property that were trespassing. Um, but anyway, it's just, just broad strokes about Mary Kay, but when we were talking about it and you were developing kind of three versions, um, specifically you talked about how one of them maybe captured some sense that you associated with mid to later, um, mid to late adult womanhood. And I think that that's an interesting sort of like idea that there is a, that culturally we have concepts of scent that can be associated with position or age. I mean, obviously we have a lot of associations around gender. I'm gonna put that to one side, but that there'd be associations around like how old somebody is. I mean, everybody realizes that, but it was a, but it's a meaty thing for me to think about that because I think in your work, you have a great deal of respect for womanhood and you have a great deal of respect for um, mid to late woman had you even talked about um, the disregard or the kind of invisibility of older women in the art world and you really kind of grabbed onto this with the Mary Kay story and tried to craft a scent that might capture some of that um, and capture the sort of love story between her and Jean um, so I am kind of jumping ahead a little bit to like where we start talking about how you make a scent but can you talk a little bit about how is somebody who thinks critically about scent makes scent, makes perfume as a perfumer, writes about it? Like how you think about the affect of a smell and sure. the identity of a smell, like where you locate that and, and how you tease that out? Yeah, I sure will. I'll try to. Um, and I can <laughs> That's tell- a long, that, long ass question. <laughs> but I can also tell that the question is very emotional for me. As you were talking, I just, um, I really felt the things you were saying. Um, and it, part of it was that Eric and I were even talking about my partner, Eric Rushman, who you also model beautifully, one of the hats. Eric. Um, also made my uh, my aviation. It's almost empty. Okay. <laughs> More. Um, oh, yeah, you can. Um, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, um, Eric and I were actually talking about the aviation. 
um, and how like around like 2008, it stopped being popular in cocktail bars and it like fell out of fashion. And now bartenders say things like, it tastes like so. And I'm bringing that up because, you know, one of the, one of the things that like connoisseurs of perfume hear the most often is that when they've worn something truly daring and iconic, people say you smell like an old woman. <laughs> Um, and of course, you're right that there's there's to it's a totally um, it's a shifting, slippery cultural association that what was popular when my grandmothers were wearing perfume now gets thought of as old lady. Um, this will all shift and has shifted um, over centuries. Like um, of what of what we what we assign or what we stick into those categories. But actually, while you were talking. Let me see if I can find the dead. Um, there's this book by Larry Mitchell called The Faggots and Their Friends During Revolutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just read this, what you were just saying. Uh, I mean, I've used this text in some things in the past couple of years and I'll, I'll try to be brief, it's two paragraphs. The faggots cultivate the most obscure and outrageous parts of the past. They cultivate those past events which the men did not want to happen and which once they did happen, they wanted to forget. These are the parts the faggots love the best and they love them so much that they tell the old stories over and over and they act them out. And then as the ultimate tribute, they allow their lives to recreate those obscure parts of the past. The pain of fallen women and the triumph of defeated women are constantly and lovingly made flesh again. The destruction of witty faggots and the militancy of beaten faggots are constantly and lovingly made flesh again. And so these parts of the past are never lost. They are imprinted in the bodies of the faggots where the men cannot go. The men want everyone to remember and commemorate only their moments of victory and plentitude. The men hope that only they have such moments. So history becomes a chronicle of wars and brutality and state splendor. Art attempts to transform men's brutishness into men's benevolence. The faggots know better. They know that one man's victory means the defeat of others and that some men's plentitude means that others go hungry. The faggots refuse to celebrate the men's lies. I would say that's a pretty guiding principle for me. Um, and particularly that like the capacity to serve as a kind of reflection or continuation for, um, as you said, just the voiceless, made, rendered voiceless invisibility of, um, of women who shaped me, who, um, who, are, who are why I make the work I make. Um, and uh, and it's, it's complicated, so complicated in my work. Like I, this afternoon to kind of like get in a zone before this, I was reading one of my favorite exhibition catalogs about Sturdivant called the Razzle Dazzle of Thinking. And of course, I think by comparison, Sturdivant citations of other artists are a bit more, what would you say, like sharper, a little more ruthless. Yeah. Um, she's like <laughs> cutting into art history and yanking it out. Um, that's not not in my work, but it's alongside reverence and then irreverence um, and, and extreme tenderness. And I'm just trying to kind of like, uh, earlier I was thinking very arrogantly, like Sturdivant played it safe, I'm brave. I mean, of course she took risks in her own way too, um, but there's That's something really about letting the, letting the love trail in, like letting that trail of perfume annotate the, the space of that reference that I think is very exposing and very vulnerable. I've thought for a long time that one of the, the, ten, the tenderness is, a, is incredibly brave and medium wise thought a lot about how that is connected to certain kind of media like working in watercolor and working in pastel which you've been doing um <laughs> lately, right and <laughs> it's interesting how like that like tenderness and vulnerability get associated with certain kinds of materiality and um i mean i i come from like a uh, fiber like craft background and I think that sort of relationship between kind of tenderness and vulnerability and certain kinds of materiality is something I've been really familiar with and that, and how that, you know, how certain kinds of emotionality gets um, 
marginalized, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting to me how you use, uh, what's the exact phrase on your website, you say that you are always in the excesses, like you said at the beginning of the introduction, and, but you don't say margins, you say excesses, so it's a, I think that's like such a wonderful and robust way to think about um, the kinds of emotionality that does and, and like materiality that gets marginalized, but to think of it as this kind of vibrant place instead of um, this squeezed place, you know, that it's actually this really rich um, and kind of robust um, zone. Like it's, it, as opposed to allowing it to be sort of squeezed. Well, and this, this is me jumping around now too. Um, <laughs> yeah, do uh, it. We're having a cocktail. <laughs> one, of, one, of, one of the influences that I was thinking about are of course like my, like the feminist French philosophers who just shaped me. Like um, I came into theory by way of uh, queer theory and, and gender studies, but it was really like this, these, you know, hard nosed, but incredibly nuanced um, thinkers that were, and so one, one text, Hélène Sixou collaborated with Catherine Clément on this book called The Newly Born Woman, which does not sound like a great title, um, but it's a great book. And something you just said made me think of it is that I am paraphrasing, but they more or less make the argument, well, they make two arguments, that, um, that jouissance, uh, this sort of feminine capacity for more than one and excess and eroticism um, under capitalism becomes hysteria, that hysteria is jouissance as it comes under the control of machinations of a heterosexist uh, treatment of capitalism. Um, and they, they start theorizing the hysteric and they, they put her alongside the sorceress as this outlier, this, this woman who's been cast out of society. Um, and they get to a point in the book, and again, I'm really oversimplifying it right now, but they basically say, maybe like, has anyone noticed she found a way out? <laughs> like she's out there now. <laughs> um, the, so the margins are the excess that like she found a way out. Maybe we got to follow the hysterical sorceress now um, because she's in a different space. And, um, and in some ways her exclusion from this system uh, may be advantageous for all of us in the long run. Yeah, I love that. I wonder, has anybody made a perfume name named Suissance? Oh, I don't know. Um, no, I don't know. You make me want to check. Everyone. <laughs> um, go to Free Grant because uh, <laughs> I, want, <laughs> I want to make sure that um, we have enough time for you to tell us how a sense made. So before we flip over we, to the slides, yeah. Will you, yeah, will you tell us a little bit? Because you did you did talk to me about this, and I want to make sure that I that we do talk about this. How um, what kinds of influences you uh, have on your work as a perfumer? Other oh, no, perfumers, other yeah. perfumes, also do objects and places and, and experiences count as influences on that work? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, like the perfumer, and, and I, the number one, I think that affects my, my work in perfume is Serge Luton. Um, and he's such a fascinating figure. He worked as the art director for Dior's cosmetic division for a couple of decades. And then he started working for Shiseido, a Japanese cosmetics brand. And then he went out on his own um, in the 90s um, and, and started making these perfumes that are really raw and really psychological. Um, like I was, I was telling a friend recently, like one of, I think the newest release in their press release for the newest perfume, it says something along the lines of this perfume will remind you of the trauma of being abandoned as a child when your mother couldn't be there for like just he just doesn't hold back. He's very intense. Um, and the perfumes, like the first that he got very recognized for was called Feminite du Bois. Um, and his in some ways it's simplistic now, but he was trying to make a a, a perfume that could be considered feminine that was also very wood forward because these were very separate concepts in the 80s. Um, and so he's kind of in some ways making a woody woman which is like a dryad but also like a kind of uh, stand-in erection. Um, and he's, he's brooding and dark and fabulous and one of my, one of my biggest influences. We'll make sure to get that like 
printed out and posted because I think yeah we have this you know when I, I listen to a few podcasts that are like check our Instagram for images of all the things we mentioned in our conversation and we could totally do that I would be happy yeah. to like pull, <laughs> I think pull people are really curious to look that up <laughs> um, and then I think it's so worth saying like at the front end of my perf my sort of perfume journey as an adult um, Eric gifted me a bottle of a perfume that was by the artist Nikki de Saint Paul. Um, and, and in the eighties, she, she worked with a perfumer to design a fragrance that was like the signature, um, perfume for, uh, uh, the tagline was something like a dangerous scent for a controversial artist or something. Um, and it, it's so sharp, it's like sharp and grassy and green, and it feels like it's going to bite you like a snake. It's very intense, but, um, but I think it totally gave me permission to see perfume within the context of art, like that, um, this will sound so mean. Um, sometimes at my exhibitions, I get into long conversations with someone going, I never thought perfume could be art before. Um, and, uh, and I guess I think they're country yokels based on the accent I adopted. And now I'm actually experiencing this with millinery, like where it's something about the hat that seems to shut some people down of seeing it as sculpture. Um, but Nikki de saint Paul was important. I think as it relates to Mary Kay, Germaine Cellier is so important to me. Um, she was one of the only female perfumers in the first half of the 20th century, oh, wow. um, noted lesbian. And, um, and she made these two scents for Robert Piguet. One, one of the greatest perfumes of all time is called Bandit. And when she oh, released Bandit- Whoa, Bandit, I know what, ba yeah, I know about Bandit. Bandit's brief, <laughs> when she described it, she said that Bandit was the smell of green stems snapped asunder, the sweat that gathers in a woman's other thing, under things, and the crack of a whip. And Bandit's gone through a lot of reforming. Um, but in the early 2000s, they did this kind of um, clone of the original one that uses a very different aroma chemicals than what was mm -hmm. available at the time, but gets closest to the smell. And my God, it came out in 1944. And it makes me blush when I smell it. It's such an intense erotic. And that was, I mean, she said that was for her butches. Like that was for the dykes. Um, and then the the very like femme lipstick lesbian um, was called Fracas. And uh, it features tuberose really prominently. Um, and I, I, as I was working on Mary Kay, those were my two goalposts were, okay. uh, were Cellier's uh, Fracas and Bandit. They were kind of like my, the space in which I was operating in. Gosh, uh, I think she's here. And so I'm almost embarrassed to say it. I'm in a current love affair with Laurie Stern, who runs a, um, a, a beautiful perfumery. Um, well, perfumery is spelled P-U-R-R -R because of kitty cats. Um, and she's, uh, I just, I don't have words for how beautiful. So I can't, I can't say how her work is influencing me yet. Um, because it's very new, but um, but when I go to the studio, uh, Laurie's perfumes are the ones that I'm like carrying with me as the standard to work from. That's so those amazing. are the perfumers. We should just keep talking, and I'll, I'll litter other influence in. in as go. Okay, so yeah, bring a tell us how you make a sense. Yeah, and I'm gonna fly everyone through. who's here. We're gonna go a little over. We started a little late. You know, what are you gonna do? It's a pandemic. Stay with us and have another cocktail. <laughs> Do that. Okay, how a perfume is made. I thought it would be helpful to just show you, and and Eric thought it was very important to say that this is not, um, this does not reflect where I'm currently at. 2019, I had far fewer materials, um, but this is the perfume corner of my studio. There are these shelves. Now there's kind of like three times the amount of bottles but it was just like, as Shannon just said, it's COVID. And so I was like, could I go to my studio and photo shoot? So we just went with an older photo. So imagine this, but with like way, way more bottles. Um, and this is what I, where I work, where I develop the perfume at. Um, and so these are, I'm gonna kind of run through these fast. Um, perfume, as we think of it, really started as sort of dry materials that were honestly most often used in religious ritual, um, such as in incense offerings uh, or burn sacrifices. Um, and, uh, and gradually, 11th, 12th century, um, we start seeing various points 
around the planet where people start making perfume where those materials are suspended in alcohol in the way that we sort of mostly think of it now. Um, these bottles are good examples of, um, of open mouthed um, bottles like our um, Mary Kay Eau de Parfum um, that is dabbed on and then gradually atomizers come into play um, because it distributes and sprays the perfume differently. So when I'm working on a perfume, it matters a great deal to me if it's a, a dabber or if it's a spray bottle, for example, like I'm, I formulate them very differently. Um, and these are just little terms that could be helpful, the lingo of the field. The tenacity of a perfume is the indication of its lasting power. I wanna say as an aside that there's, there's a lot of class tension, I think, in the way we talk about tenacity of perfume. I think people, there are, there are class distinctions around perfume, wanting perfume to be high performance. I want a scent that lasts eight hours. Whereas like some of the most exquisite, gorgeous, expensive perfumes I own um, are relatively fleeting. Um, mm. And I think that that's actually good and totally okay. Um, but it goes counter to a type of, I don't know, workhorse middle-class ethic around, um, around uh, the expense that gets associated with perfume. And as I said earlier, perfume sillage is the measurement of the trail of its projection off the body. A scent that only the wearer can smell is said to be, quote, close to the skin. You see that a lot these days as office culture prior to COVID was becoming more and more hostile towards, uh, and more xenophobic, frankly, towards smell. Um, perfumes being marketed as staying very close to the body became, have been very attractive in recent years. Um, and then again, as I think Shannon gestured to, to a little while ago, um, this is a very big topic we could unpack in Q&A if you'll care to. The gendering of perfume goes in and out of sort of um, more or less unofficial regulation through different eras and locales. Um, so things that are considered masculine now were maybe considered feminine even as recently as 30 years ago. It, it's a very unstable measurement of how perfume gets discussed. Mm -hmm. And then I found in talks, in terms of talking about like the construction of perfume, it could be helpful to just briefly uh, tell you the different kinds of things that go into perfumes. In the broadest sense, all fragrance materials are aroma chemicals. Um, but oftentimes this refers to particular compounds developed synthetically in a lab. Um, there are a number of ways that scent may be captured or extracted from various organic materials. Um, pomades have mostly fallen out of use but are the result of oils being absorbed into masses of fat, as in the enfleurage technique, which I'll say a little more about in a minute. Um, tinctures are very straightforward. I make them all the time. Um, it's an infusion process where you put alcohol and a thing, a bottle, and you shake it every day, and gradually whatever that thing's uh, residual oils are, transfer and break, up, break down into the alcohol. Sometimes you strain the thing out and put more of the thing in. Uh, like the most recent example I have is that growing up in Louisiana, chicory is very common in our coffee. And mm -hmm. I have a really sort of, I have a real sensitivity to chicory as a note. Um, and, and yet it's not really available as a material in perfumery, at least not in a very accessible way. So I've made a lot of chicory tinctures where like, um, it's, it would almost be like uh, brewing a pot of coffee and then changing out the grounds and putting more of the gr new grounds in and then running the coffee through again, where you're just intensifying. Um, essential oils specifically refer to the oily liquids extracted by means of distillation or extraction. Um, concretes are materials, often a semi-solid mass, obtained through a solvent extraction technique. Absolutes are purifications of that concrete process. Um, I'm very interested in this sort of funky area called isolates that consists of an individual type of molecule that is found in the very quote unquote natural world um, and by a number of processes has been isolated from the complex compositions of organic materials. So like, what are, what's an example? Coumarin is a material that's found in vanilla um, and it's one of the most enhancing parts of vanilla. Um, but now at this point, it's been isolated from vanilla beans and you can just get the molecule. Um, and then synthetic compounds are perfume materials that have no correspondence to the quote unquote natural world um, and are developed as entirely artificial materials. And if you give me just one second, um, I think here might be a place where 
I want to sort of politicize my position. Um, I'm extremely invested in artifice, cheap workarounds, and draggy sorts of performances and materials. Um, by holding, like coming from painting and holding it between things like perfume and millinery, um, I'm interested in making claims that concern both the cosmetic and structural dimensions of these mediums. Um, synthetic, synthetic aromachemistry is so fraught in many, many ways. Um, it, um, it follows many of the ingredients we think of now as available to the perfumer's palate um, came about during the industrial revolution directly following abolition when there was a rush internationally to find ways to make technologies stand in for, um, for the, uh, the loss of uh, that previous dependency on enslaved populations to perform labor and manufacturing. Um, many of the aroma chemicals that have been produced synthetically are byproducts of the petrochemical industry. Um, so I, I, I want to sort of touch on briefly and say like, these are not innocent materials and neither are naturals. Um, like naturals are also going to be fraught with histories of sort of uh, colonialism and imperial trade. Um, and more recently, um, endangerment and um, rarefication of materials that become uh, over, over farmed. Um, and so perfume, like any material we would use as artists, um, I think it deserves deep investigation of like all of these different kinds of things that go into perfume are also connected to massive arrays of political um, sort of questions that each of us have to develop an ethics around. Um, just for fun, here's a picture of a few stills, of course, also used in um, the manufacture of spirits. Um, but this is a, these are contraptions that boil and condense vapors that help extract um, materials like the ones that I was just listing on the previous slide. Oh, and I mentioned enfleurage. It's so gorgeous. It's just not efficient. So people don't really do it very much anymore. Wow. Um, enfleurage is this process of having large panes, usually of glass, on these trays and spreading a uh, animal fats, usually odorless animal fats, across mm -hmm. the glass trays and laying flowers into them. And as those flowers release their oils, you take these flowers out and put more flowers in. And you can do that several or many times. Um, and the resulting infused fat is a pomade, which historically, mm -hmm. like circa Marie Antoinette, was often just sold as pomade um, mm -hmm. or can be purified into an absolute um, and used as a perfume material. There are some, if, you, if you're interested in learning more about enfleurage, there are so many great independent for perfumers who keep this, um, this sort of older art going because they're not concerned with like Chanel level of manufacture. Um, and uh, I found Etsy to be a great place to uh, meet and, and learn more about folks who are continuing to use enfleurage. So very briefly, because especially it pertains to how we've presented Mary Kay, um, there are different concentrations of perfumes. Um, and these are rough numbers, like this is someone else's diagram. I'm sure we could find these edges a little debatable. Um, but uh, oh fresh, fresh, we never really see these, not often. They're like, um, they're like those body mist sprays at um, Bath and Body Works. Um, Eau de Cologne is the sort of complicated thing too, right? Because Eau de Cologne means a specific cologne from history that Napoleon wore. And it also in the United States, especially in the middle classes, especially in the white middle classes, cologne has come to be an identifying term for perfume worn by men. And that's like a whole other thing to think through. And it's also a concentration in perfume. Um, the two main ones though are Eau de Toilette and Eau de Parfum. And then anything above Eau de Parfum could be called a, called a parfum or an extrate. Um, and these are, uh, these are um, juices that are in predominantly the scented material. An eau de toilette is about four to 15% um, of the scented material and the rest is alcohol to sort of break up those molecules. Um, our Mary Kay I think is 15%. And then our eau de parfum is really closer to 25%. Um, it's, it's a very rich sort of sumptuous version of the scent um, of perfume ingredients balanced against alcohol. Uh, perfumes are, this is again, very historical and, and maybe debatable in some ways, um, but perfumes are often identified as having top notes, heart notes, and base notes. So those, those top notes are 
ingredients that evaporate really quickly. Um, I think of citrus as a good example where the first thing you smell, the first thing you pull into your nostrils are these really bright notes that are very um, unstable and they evaporate much faster. And heart notes are generally where those of us who make perfume are really kind of building the claim of the scent um, is that part where it's the thing you smell most of the time um, after that sort of opening. And then the base notes are these lingering effects, again, to invoke Laurie for a second. Um, Laurie Stern has a, a fairly new scent called Luminous Lemurs, and the base is sandalwood and vanilla, both um, that she's had for over 20 years um, and stored so as not to participate in sort of this current sort of uh, drain on those two materials. And, and they are the lingering effects. Hours later, um, they're still on the skin, sort of beautifully haunting. Um, I can say that as a perfumer, I'm not actually that good at top notes. Um, I don't understand them very well. Mary Kay's top note is mostly orange blossom. Um, and even that, it, it, it lingers. Um, so uh, I'm still learning about that top section. And then I just wanted, this is just a very brief slide, the one on the left, I hardly want to talk about, except that um, linear structures and fragrances are really fascinating. Um, and they're also not taken, I don't think people respect them enough. Um, linear perfumes are a perfume that as soon as you spray it, it smells the same the whole time. And so in general, they're considered um, maybe, uh, they're marketed to people who aren't as knowledgeable about perfume. Um, and they just want something that smells, you know, whatever they spray in the morning, they want that to be the thing that they smell all day. Um, but actually making a linear perfume requires basically genius levels of intelligence because all of the materials you put into it have to have the same sort of wear time so that everything sort of keeps up with itself. Um, and so I, you know, like I have a great love of like Avon perfumes where the, these are like high performance workhorses um, that are actually really complicated to make. Um, they're really difficult. And then just because I think people are always kind of curious about this, um, the breakdown of notes of like how much of each thing is in the perfume. And this is a generality. I'm sure any of the perfumers who are here could also sort of weigh in on this, that top notes tend to be about 30%. It's almost the same amount as the base notes. And then a good chunk of what you're blending into the alcohol are your middle notes. And this is one of the beautiful bottles that the Oxbow staff has produced for Mary Kay. And that is the, that's my, I don't, again, I don't know how fast that was, uh, but that's my rundown. How perfume gets made. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Well, I think yeah. um, we'll, we'll just break now to see if anybody has any questions. Um, I'll just let everybody know that, you know, as Matt said, he uh, produced both a eau de toilette and eau de parfum concentration for us. And the eau de parfum is a limited edition that, um, we bottled 25 bottles of with um, the handmade perfume bottles that our glass staff, Jonathan Shee and Lucy Gillis produced for us this summer. I think it's an amazing scent. It's really rich. Um, I would say having worn it, um, I like it as an evening scent. I, I like to put it on at night. I find it to be something that, that feels like a good wind down smell. It has a lot of like really deep, um, it has like a depth to it or it feels like emotionally deep or something, but it, it has a kind of richness to it that feels really good to put on at dusk. Um, that's my feeling about it. It's sitting on my desk. I roll a little bit on at the end of the day. Um, so that's my, that's my experience of the Mary Kay. Um, so I'll open it up to questions. Um, Sierra's taking them in the chat box. Um, maybe also you want to let us know what you're wearing right now. Maybe you've got a favorite um, scent that you wear every day or almost every day that you want to share with us. And maybe Matt's got a, a reflection on um, that particular smell. Oh, it's it's top 33 over and over. <laughs> <laughs> My scent, by the way, Matt, that I wear all the time is Gallup Dermes. It's, oh, that's it's my really favorite. Good. It's a really uh, sort of... I'd say genderless kind of woodsy smell. It's my favorite. Any questions from y'all? Did you reveal everything there was to know about scent? No way. <laughs> 
Tell us about your hat. Oh, yeah. Um, it It is a powder puff um, fascinator. Uh, it has these beautiful bits of silk that have been hand dyed that has... Um, hmm? Oh, no, I, I'm not going to give it to people. Oh, it's like that. Um, that the silk has text that was um, like, uh, what's the word for that? Um, resisted while, um, while I was dyeing the silk. So it says tough titty poudre um, and it's sort of a breast um, and it's got this like wedge of tool behind it um, oh. with like an edge mm. of my feather. It's amazing. Yeah, it's got a really nice sort of profile. Um, and then it's just got all of these different sort of ribbons and feathers and I don't remember if this one has pearls on it, I think it does. Um, and uh, it's just this sort of investigation into like powder puffs and I'm, I've been sort of following that instinctively, but invariably there's no avoiding that like powders throughout the 20th century were marketed and still are marketed based on skin color. Um, and so um, one of the things that I'm still like trying to figure out, wrap my head around is that like right now I'm at the threshold of understanding that powder matters to me along, alongside perfume and millinery and these sort of other kind of, um, I don't know, accessory gestures. Um, I, I believe powder might be very fraught. Um, so I, that's, that's where the work is headed, I think. Was that inspired by the cover of uh, Le Chariot that you were drawing and redrawing over the season? Yes. Yeah. I, Actually, um, a friend of mine made the connection and I was like, I truly had not thought about it, but I think that there's an, I just think I orbit around thoughts yeah, on different directions <laughs> and they eventually sort of collide into each other. But that, that, that figure that was on the magazine cover, um, I mean, I guess I'm obsessed with her. She seems to have agency to me, um, considering pinups are often presented as a kind of object and she is an object because she's a powder puff but she's got this hand up, like she can pull the box down and disappear whenever she wants to. Um, and I just think that, that that sort of like appearing and disappearing and how we appear um, and what the powders are on, I don't know. Um, I'm still processing it. It's all very new work. You have a question that's um, from someone who wonders if you will make custom scents for everyday people, like on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I imagine. I guess the answer is um, not right now. Um, I just haven't, I haven't quite figured that out um, for myself. It would be so expensive. That's one of the things that I just haven't quite figured out yet is that like what the production costs are and what the, what my time would be to formulate. I just, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm selling myself short. I just don't know if people are quite prepared for the sticker shock of what would be involved in formulating something bespoke like that. Um, so no, not right now, but it's something that people ask me a lot. I'm not completely opposed to it, but um, who knows, no, not right now. Um, you have another question from Jesse Malmed who uh, wants, who says, loved your descriptions and lens into the lexicon of scent. Curious where you find non-causal like brassy scent terms coming from. Lots of visual metaphors, taste. What are some terms you've gleaned from scent talk that we should know? Oh, this is such a good question. Um, uh, the first thing I'm gonna suggest, and it's actually on Amazon now too, but it's been on YouTube for a long time. There's this great BBC documentary that's three episodes long about perfume. Um, and one of the things that they talk a lot about, they for, I think it's the third episode, they follow, the episode starts in a limousine and there's a woman who looks like Meryl Streep in The Devil Wears Prada on a cell phone. And she's going like, yes, no, yes, no, that'll be hot. Let's go with that. And clapping her phone shut. Um, and then we find out that she's like the marketing uh, director for um, Axe Body Spray. And she's <laughs> traveling around the world doing these very uncomfortable uh, consumer tests with groups of um, pubescent boys. And she's like smelling the new Axe body or spraying the body spray. And then she's like leaning in saying, what do you think might happen with your girlfriend if you wore this on a date? And it's very weird. 
And then at one point they interview her and she goes, oh, well, the thing you have to understand that is that in the United States, people are not sent literate. Um, and mm -hmm. she compares it to Brazil as a space where there's actually a lot of language and a lot of cultural appreciation for how scent works. And so I think Jesse's totally right. Um, in English, as at least I practice it, oftentimes we lack vocabulary for the description of scent. Um, and so it, we often, I mean, we often turn to metaphoric language. And, and actually it can be exhausting and contradictory and confusing because perfume reviews, a lot like wine reviews actually, when I think about it, will like shift from a music metaphor to a color metaphor. Um, and so it's, it's not philosophically rigorous. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I, and I guess I would suggest that I, I wrote this text last year the name of which I don't remember. Oh, it's called Zara's Cotton Kiss is Not a Kiss, or it is an analysis. And I was writing a perfume review, and I guess you could say I had an existential breakdown while I was doing it. Um, and it really came to this point um, that Jesse's bringing up about language. And I was, I think I might just actually pull up part of it. Um, I was sort of like freaking out about maybe how wide and loose language had become in relationship to perfume um, and, uh, and in particular, this perfume that had been released by Zara called Cotton Kiss. It just seemed maybe at the very least tone deaf to release something uh, that sort of echoes a history of enslaved people on plantations harvesting cotton, but not really thinking about it. Um, but I, I think I'll just read this because I think it's insane. Um, I might have said Zara perfumes could be called anything but in fact, I believe it's more realistic to say Zara perfumes will be called everything eventually. Thus positioned at a half-life between the pre-verbal and an absolute totality in which all phonemes have been arranged into all available configurations to mean anything and describe nothing, we might face off with something seemingly manageable like Femme from Zara circa, circa 2012, or the simply numbered scent number one, scent number two, scent number three, and so on from 2018. Then there are the Roman numerals from 2014, like LXI or LXXXV, et cetera. The 2015 coordinates, and I'm not gonna even read them. They, the names of these perfumes are uh, global coordinates, numbers and little quotation marks. The hyper-specific Zara artisan collection from 2017, including Woodboard's Studio in Melbourne. Then the eight, 2018 eccentric molecule riffs like Four Ambrox and Kashmirin the oddly political pipeline perfume from 2018 and its companion dark crude. Um, word salads like legend iron from 2018, don't follow from 2018, thunder feel from 2019, blue shape from 2019, or pink flambe winter from 2019. The bleak no day and no night, both from 2019, the somewhat alarmingly surrealist erotica Blue Hole from 2019, um, the presumptuous of a, presumptuousness of a spice's gender identity, 2018's cardamom gender neutral, the ones that I suspect were invented and submitted to our index literally just to fuck with me, like 2019's share reality and true fact. Um, I could keep listing, but... Um, but uh, I guess I'm bringing it up to say, um, oh, je veux de fête. Sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I guess I'm bringing it up to say that like um, my stakes in perfume criticism, especially, is to um, demonstrate for myself and others the playfulness and the potential of language as a kind of technology um, and the ways you can sort of shoehorn words into meaning things or maybe more fatalistically uh, mean nothing. Um, and perfume and language becomes a sort of, for me, a powerful crisis, I guess I would say to that. And would you recommend um, Fragrantica where you write as an interest, as like a smart place for people to think about? Language? I mean, if you want to nerd out about perfume, that's the place to go. Yeah, do you write quite a bit? Um, I do, or I go in bouts. It's been a second. I need to get back to it. Um, but uh, I love it. Um, but partly I love it because it's such a, um, you know, the last thing I wrote for uh, Extra, Contemporary Art Quarterly, 
um, had 17 drafts between the first writing and publication. <laughs> and Frank Rantic I have, for that. <laughs> has more or less no drafts. And so sometimes I have terrible typos in my essays, but I almost just like prefer, gosh, like when do writers get the instant gratification of something you've written being online the same day and, and getting paid <laughs> fairly well for it. Um, <laughs> So it's it's a good gig for me, and um, and I love it. I love the I love the community on Fragrantica. It it draws all kinds. Like Eric and I were thinking about this perfume for him um, by Serge Luton called Un Bois Vanil, and we were doing a little research about it. And one person said, "This is the perfect perfume to wear to a Christian death metal concert." And we were like, "I don't know how that fits into our goals right now." <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's a great starting place. So you've got two last questions before we end. I know we went way over. Thank you for everyone who's decided to keep drinking with us tonight. I think it's been really fun. And I'm, and I'm really excited about everything we've talked about, Matt. And like, well, we didn't even like- We got so much more to do. It's like there's so much more, but um, we got two questions. I know you're seeing them too. Let's answer John's first. Um, do some fragrances mix with body chemistry and smell different on different people? And the answer is yes, all fragrances do that. And it's actually almost like a parlor trick when I have people, well, before COVID, when people come into my studio, um, I'll like dab a perfume on both of our wrists and then we'll smell it. And I, without fail, we're like, oh my God, it smells like two different perfumes. So yes, I think that's really a real thing. Um, you know, like, as I was mentioning, uh, my partner smells so good in, in a vanilla perfume and almost all vanilla perfumes smell like well, I was gonna say a cheap Yankee candle. I don't know, Yankee candles aren't that cheap. I, they're very expensive, um, but just a cheap vanilla. I smell trashy and cheap with most vanilla scents, um, but it like teases out something very like sweaty and spicy in Eric that always plays really well. Um, yeah. And so it, it, I do, yes, yes, the answer is yes. Um, and also it changes, like I have this great, if anyone wants this, find me on Instagram and ask, um, there's this lady, in New York, and I don't remember, I think the place is just called the Perfume Shop. And she does make bespoke perfumes. And she does this like kind of quick, almost like shocker reading to figure out what you need in your life. And then she blends a little perfume oil. Um, and I've had a few made over the years and I wear one called, well, you get to name it yourself. And it was one I wear is called Kitchen Kunsthal Witch. Um, and I will say that one of the things I've noticed to that with that is not only does it change smell different or in different people and also it totally changes if I get like hot and sweaty it's very different mm -hmm. I, the the reason I'm really bringing it up is it's it changes scent when I get angry um wow. like, it's almost like a, a protective pet that gets very pissed off if I get upset um and I think that's a real thing like I don't think I'm imagining that I think it's our bodies interacting with these things oh yeah I feel like you can often smell people's emotions on them. I completely agree with that. Like, especially when it comes to anger that people or stress, people give off a completely different smell than they do when they're happy. I definitely feel like I've witnessed that as I'm sure many of our listeners. Last question, um, which is a long one. I, and I know you can see it too. Um, I'm wearing Jean Laporte's Jour de Fête today, given to be my, my 80s New York City roommates who passed of AIDS in celebration of today's inauguration. Do you know it and your thoughts if you do? Um, I think I know it, but this is this is why I'm having, I'm just looking something up real quick. Um, it's a re-release. Okay, so Jour de Fete, as I know it, is, um, is this the, I, so I'm just shooting in the dark. If this is the one by L'Artisan, um, then I do know it. It was discontinued and then re-released. And in my understanding, it was reformulated at that time. Um, and so I have a jour de fete that is, um, that is, was designed by Olivia Jacobetti, who, um, but you said Laporte. So let me just try to figure out where is he? What's his, I don't know. Um, jour de fete, uh, the one I have is made by Olivia Jacobetti. I was literally wearing it yesterday, which is why I gasped when I saw it in the questions. Um, it is, the one I know is, uh, it smells mostly like raw flour, like a bread flour. Mm -hmm. um, and 
It is so delicate. And it has a little bit of almond and a little bit of vanilla, um, but it's not a sweet scent. It's very dry on the skin. It's extremely delicate. And actually you mentioned when you asked influences earlier, I, I trimmed this one off for time, but uh, if I was gonna name anyone else, it would be Olivia Chocobetti. Um, uh, nothing I make smells like anything she makes. <laughs> I probably wish it did. She's such a genius. She's a living, she's still alive, great perfumer. Um, almost everything she blends, not all, not, but no, most of it are eau de toilettes. She actually prefers working in that lighter concentration, um, which I think is very interesting. Um, mm. She has such a good nose for iris, which is really one of my favorite um, categories of scent. Um, and uh, and there's such a, yeah, she, she is my go-to, I think, for daily wear because almost anything she makes has a quietness and a contemplative. I would say they've been very good to me during COVID especially. Um, and then hang on, let me see. Your thoughts if you do. I enjoy fragrances. Yeah, there's a second part to that question, which I think is a good one. I enjoy fragrances that I don't like, but learn to like them because a person who gifted it. Your thoughts on that. Um, actually, there are people in this chat who I have given um, given perfumes to. And I think it depends on the person. Sometimes they let me know that they've never worn it. And other times they let me know that they have developed a deep, rich, emotional relationship to it. Um, and then I would say people, um, what, what, what? Also, I find I only wear perfume to bed these days all on Marilyn Monroe, Monroe, because so many people tell me they're allergic. Help solutions. I don't have a good solution for this. Actually, there's um, a great, Oh, I think great. There's an article, an essay I wrote for Fragrantica that describes a mortifying day at SAC, where we both teach. Um, and uh, I was in the painting faculty office and uh, it was the first day of classes for the semester. And I had put on Chanel's Bois de Zille. Um, and then another teacher came in and as soon as they walked into the room, they said, Blech! And then they said, it smells like pesticide, an old lady in here. Oh. I, I was like, that's me. I'm so sorry. I put too much perfume on. I shouldn't have done it in this little room. And they were like, no, it couldn't be you. It smells too horrible to be a person. And I was like, no, it's me. I promise. Please stop saying words. Um, and then they were like, we have to get this door open. Oh, my God. Smell. And, and they, they were so indirectly hostile. Like, they were convinced it wasn't me, but it, it was definitely me. Um, and I don't know, I don't know about that. Like, am I willing? I just don't know anymore. Um, on the one hand, in some ways, this is a moot point because I haven't left my apartment since March. Um, and so everything I wear, I wear for my own pleasure. Um, and I don't have to be considerate of anyone. Um, but, uh, but I don't have a solution for this thing about navigating the world um, and thinking about people's allergies and so on. Um, yeah, I think there's a, it's I like as we're talking about this I'm thinking about just how much smellier the world used to be I mean people were smoking and wearing a lot of perfume and like you know bathing in a different way and you know there just was a completely different olfactory experience of the world probably just 50 years ago let alone like 150 years ago that um we're you know, retreating into a very like controlled scent environment. But it's very complicated. And well, in my, I mean, this is my two cents is that I think that this, this sort of contemporary concern around fragrance is oftentimes very xenophobic um, in its sort of underlying drives um, because almost nothing is without scent. And so like uh, occasionally and like when, I'm going to show a scent piece in a museum or an institution. We'll get into these sort of complicated questions about like, oh, well, what about allergies and so on? And then we eventually have to look at the fact that like all air fresheners, all floor cleaners, all bathroom cleaners, like it's all scented. It just, it's scented like white people. Um, and so uh, a lot of these concerns about smell, I find to have a really anti-immigration <laughs> um, underfooting. Um, and it has to do with like wanting to eliminate like people whose bodies smell like other cuisines that you don't recognize and so on. And so my, my feeling is that the world is not unscented. It's just there are spaces that have become more controlling 
to try to make space and those environments more aligned to specific sensibilities. And uh, I think we should really be scrutinizing the subtexts uh, for those impulses. I think that is an amazing and critical place to, to end our discussion. Yeah, I mean, it's so good. Perfect. Um, Matt, uh, a total pleasure to talk to you this evening and have a cocktail with you and um, hear how you think about your work and how you think about scent. And I hope um, everyone who's here tonight, I know there's lots of folks here who know you already. If folks are here who aren't familiar with you will dig deeper into your practice. Um, and those folks who are gonna watch this later because we will post it, we'll do the same. Um, but uh, we'll have another Oxtails and Cocktails next month in February and um, TBD, who our guest will be, but somebody else from our extended Oxbow community. But I really appreciate you being the one to kick it off, Matt. Oh, um, always such a talking with you. <laughs> it was also just amazing that, um, I'll just say to everyone listening who's left that, you know, I really, reached out to Matt kind of super on the fly to say, hey, do you think you would make a design ascent for Oxbow? And the enthusiasm and generosity that you responded to that invitation with um, are really memorable to me. You were really excited to make something for Oxbow. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I love it more than any place on the planet. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I, I would never have, like, I don't mean that to sound mean, but I just, I'm from the South. I just never even thought about Michigan. Um, and Oxbow is one of the most magical, special places that I've ever been in. I always want to be back in the winter, not in the summer. Um, but uh, but uh, I'll be there every winter you ever want me there. Well, then it's great that the label has Mary Kay in the winter at Oxbow. Yeah. It's, it's the only Oxbow I know. Yeah. It's the only Oxbow I want to know. As Claire just said into the chat box, you're the winter witch. I am the winter witch. <laughs> That's a nice thing to say. <laughs> Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we have a special discount for you if you haven't got a, 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 an addition of the Mary Kay yet. Um, I don't know where the code is. Maybe it'll come up. Is it on the next slide, Sierra? It was showing up on the thing, but I think that the present button took oh, it out. Oh, weird. Hold on. <laughs> One second. <laughs> well, tell us I'll what it is. In, I'll, I'll add it into the chat. Well, yeah, no. Carol put it in the chat box. Um, and thanks for joining us tonight. We have a little discount. There you go. You can get a discount on our Mary Kay scent designed by Matt Morris and limited edition of 25 of the Eau de Parfum. The Eau de Toilette is an open edition that's in a roll on bottle. And the Eau de Parfum comes with a classic glass um, dabber stopper. Dabber stopper? Is that what you call it? I think a dabber stopper sounds good to me. Sure, it's a dabber stopper. <laughs> um, stay tuned for some other events. Um, and thanks again, Matt. I hope to see you in the flesh some day. <laughs> okay, well, y'all take care. Thank you so much for everyone who came. Mwah, mwah. Talk to y'all soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>